Well, good evening. Welcome to Christ Community Church. We want to say a special welcome to our online community. Pastor Daryl is away, and so um, I get to be with you this week and next week. So I'm excited about that. My name is Bill Kuhn. I serve as the vice president and the campus chaplain for Crown College. Crown College is affiliated with the same organization that this church is affiliated with. And so we are partners in the work of the kingdom. And so if you have questions about Crown College, you certainly can talk to me. But that's not why I came today. I came today because I believe, and I think you came today, because you believe there's something in this book that's unique for God's people. That God wants to use the words in these, the pages of this book to communicate to us. And so I want to pray and ask God to give us wisdom and a discerning heart for what God would want to say to us this evening. Would you pray with me as we begin? God, it is truly our desire that Christ would be magnified, that over everything that we say and do, that people would see Jesus. And now as we come, Lord, we, we come with a, a spirit of humility as we want to learn, as you would instruct us, as you would equip us, as you would challenge us. So God, we put before you our very lives and trust you will use these minutes for your glory. And this we pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Now, please do not throw shade at me, but on February the 22nd, when the blizzard hit here in Minnesota, I was in Ohio. It was awesome. It was 70 degrees. I was there with my nephews. We were playing basketball and so forth. But what happened is because of the blizzard, I got stuck in Ohio, and I was unable to get to Minnesota, and so my brother, who was a couple hours away, he called and said, hey, can I come and get you? It looks like you're gonna be in Ohio for a few extra days, sure. He picks me up. We're in an unfamiliar area when he picks me up, but that's okay because in his car is a global positioning system. You know what I'm talking about? a GPS, and it's right there in the middle of the dashboard, and we're driving, again, unfamiliar, we're driving along, and suddenly we realize we're in the wrong lane. And we're not gonna be able to change even though the GPS is telling us to go to the left. And so guess what we did? We missed the first exit. That's okay, we continue a little longer, and now remember, I haven't seen my brother in months, and we're talking and we're laughing and we're getting caught up and we missed our second exit. And it was there that we discovered a very important principle. Apparently, the GPS is no good when you don't pay attention. That's what we learn. Because if you're not careful, even if it tells you where to go, you still can miss the exit. Now, how many of you how many of you, even though you look right on the screen and see where you're supposed to go, you've still turned the wrong way or missed your exit? Come on, come on, show, uh, yeah. Little confession here in church. That's good for the soul, I like it. All right, we've all done it, right? We've all missed it, and if we're not careful, we could be headed to Vancouver and end up in like Tucson, Arizona, right? So, but what I have found is that life is sometimes like that. What we really need is a GPS. We need that soothing voice that says when you drive past the exit, rerouting. <laughs> and sometimes I need rerouting. And I suspect that if we were to look back over our lives, we might think, you know, it really would have been nice on a couple occasions to have someone tell us it's time to get off the highway. Wouldn't it be nice if we had someone waving kind of, maybe a flag or something that says exit here, yield here, uh, slow down, 
turn left, turn right, stop. Wouldn't it be nice to have something like that in life? What we really are saying is that we need wisdom. Now, I want you to know how important wisdom is. I think for most of us, when we look back on our lives, we would say something like this. You know, life would be different for me if I just had some more money. Or life would be different for me if I just had different friends. Or life would be different for me if I had a new job. And I'm here to tell you that what we really need is wisdom. That if we really were to consider our past, what we really want is a GPS that would reroute us in the direction of wisdom. Now, every culture tries to capture wisdom in these pithy statements, short sayings based on a long observation of life They are called Proverbs. Every culture in the world has Proverbs. For example, the Chinese have a proverb. It goes like this. Talk does not cook rice. That's good. The uh, Spanish proverb says this. He who knows too little talks too much. The English have a a statement, a short saying based on a long observation. It says this, call a man a thief and he will steal. We have American proverbs that have found their way into common vernacular. We see them on shirts and mugs and signs and coaches and teachers use these things to educate and inspire people. Help me out here. Different strokes for? There you go. Short saying based on long observation. How about this one? A penny saved is a? All right, you're you're 100% so far. All is fair in love and? Good job. Now, you can see the value of the proverb because if I were to give you this tidbit of advice, quote, persons whose character bears striking resemblance tend to associate with those of similar affinities. Exactly. (laughs) But I bet you know this. Birds of a feather. The proverb contains a wisdom statement. Pithy, memorable, cagey, that helps us and serves, if you will, as a GPS. It signals it's time to turn. It gives us the warnings in life. Don't do this, do this. The Bible has a collection of Proverbs. All through the Bible, there are Proverbs. There is an anthology of wise sayings in the book of, you guessed it, Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is rooted in daily life. It is our rerouting voice. The ancients used to refer to the book of Proverbs as the book of two paths. The book of two paths. That's because the book references pathways a number of times. But we know things like in the book, there is the difference between light and darkness. And that is spelled out or Life versus death, good versus evil, humility versus pride, productive living versus lazy living, or wise versus otherwise. Two paths. Instructions for living to keep us on the wise side of life, to make sure we're getting off at the right exits. Here's how... King Solomon, who authored much of the book, here's how he introduces the book of Proverbs. I'm reading from the message. It says this, these are the wise sayings of Solomon, David's son, Israel's king, written down 
so we'll know how to live well and right, to understand what life means and where it's going, GPS. It's a manual for living, for learning what's right and just and fair, to teach the inexperienced the ropes and give our young people a grasp of reality. Don't you want all of those things? Of course we do. Of course we want a manual for living. Of course we wanna know where life is going. Of course we want a GPS for our daily living. And we have it here in the book of Proverbs. It gives us the two paths. The wise path that leads to righteousness and fulfillment and the otherwise path. That is the path that doesn't lead to fulfillment. And what I want to do here with our minutes together is kind of land on what I think kind of captures the essence of the entire book of Proverbs. It's a familiar passage. In fact, my guess is there are some here that have memorized this passage. It really helps give guidance and direction to your very life. And while we have memorized it and seen it in a number of forms, we maybe haven't spent a lot of time unpacking it. So if you have your Bibles or your app, turn or tap over to Proverbs chapter 3. And here in chapter 3, we have this famous passage that begins with a wise statement. In other words, on the path, here's the first thing that you know as you travel down a wise direction. Proverbs 3, 5 says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him. God, he will make your paths straight. Here's the wise part of that first verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust. It's kind of an abstract idea, isn't it? I mean, what does it mean to trust? Interesting, in the ancient cultures, they really did gain their vocabulary from very practical scenarios in life. The idea of trust meant to cling to something. It meant, in a sense, to grab something to sturdy or steady oneself. So cling to God to steady yourself and do it with all your heart. The heart is an important concept in the book of Proverbs. It's mentioned 64 times in the whole book of 31 chapters, twice a chapter. The heart, for us, we tend to think of it as like that's the seat of your emotions. But in the ancient culture, in the biblical times, the heart represented like your entire life because when your heart stops, your life ends. And so the heart included like your intellect. It included your emotions. It included your will. Here Solomon is writing and he's saying, let me remind you where you need to get off on the exit. Don't drive past this, friend. We need to cling to God with all our heart, our entire being. We need to cling to God. Church, I fear that we believe in God, but we don't trust him. We affirm that God indeed exists. We assert that Jesus has come and he has died for our sins and we have salvation through our faith in him and that when we die, we believe we will go to heaven. But when it comes to our daily living, we don't always trust him. We're no longer paying attention to the wisdom that God offers to us. We believe in God. I don't know that we always trust him. You say, well, how do I know if I'm trusting God? Good question. Here's a clue. When life begins to pinch, 
What do we run to first? When life begins to pinch, what do we run to first? Because I submit to you that what we do is we run to that which we believe will help relieve our pressure to get us out of trouble. And so we run to a parent, a drug, relationships, food, a bank account, shopping, pornography. We run to those things to get that pressure out of our life. Whatever we run to first, that is what we are trusting for our life. And I think I'm right that at the cornerstone of much of life's pain and frustration and hurt and regrets lies this simple idea. We have put our trust in things that have not delivered on their promise. We have put our trust in friends and a boss and parents. They don't deliver on the promise of fulfillment. And it's not just people. It could be money or dreams or sex or addictions. And they don't live up to the promise. And in contrast to that is an all-wise, infinite creator who has all knowledge and power and can supply all that is needed in our moment of need. Listen to Isaiah chapter 40. You can hear in the language here that the people are asking a similar question. They're asking like, God, like, why aren't you coming through here? And so they ask questions, they say things like this. This is God, start, God starts the conversation, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them all by name. Because of his great power and his mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is everlasting God. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary in his understanding. No one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, they will soar. They will renew their strength and they will soar. On, e on wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. The infinite, wise, strength, powerful knowledge of God is the bottomless treasure of wisdom for life. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 34 says, issues a challenge. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Come on, I dare you. Put your life in the hands of God and see if he doesn't fulfill the promise. He doesn't deliver on the promise. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Back to Proverbs chapter three, verse five. That's the wise statement is put your trust in God. Here's the other wise statement. Do not lean on your own understanding. Here you've got the contrasting option. And you read that, like, do not lean on your own understanding. It sounds like God is saying, choose ignorance. And that's not what is being said here. No, God wants us to use our brains under his supervision. It was Jesus who said we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But leaving God out of life, that is not wisdom. Interesting, by the way, you can see from this verse that the idea of leaning is parallel to the idea of trusting. They're almost interchangeable, right? 
So you could say, trust in the Lord with all your heart or lean on the Lord with all your heart. I told you what the meaning of trust is, right? To cling to something to steady you. Now the author says lean. It means to take our strength and put it on something else. And it strikes me that all of us came into the room and sat in the chair and were leaning on the chair. I don't see anybody kind of on the edge of the seat as if the chair's not going to hold up to its promise. But if, before you arrived, I came and sabotaged the bottom of the chair and you were to go to sit on it, you'd find that it doesn't hold you up because... Our trust and our leaning is only as good as the object that we're leaning on. I had a colleague come into my office this week, and he walked into my office, and he sat on the table in my, in my office. And I said, oh, brother, <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think that, that table was designed for you to sit on. I'm, I'm afraid you, you should not sit on that. Here the author is telling us we need to trust, we need to lean on God. And I know, I know we're here, we're in church. We all know that we are to trust God. We've heard that before. But let's be honest. We live in the real world, right? I mean, the Bible, it's, it was written many years ago in a different part of the world, I've got real world challenges. I've got real world issues. I need real solutions. And so here's what we do. We drive down the highway of life and we ignore the wisdom that the Bible offers because I can do it myself. And what happens is we do it ourselves until we can't do it ourselves. We do it ourselves until we come to the end and we go, okay, That didn't work, so I will try God. I think sometimes we we mix the wisdom. I know this is how some of us work. We come and we get, in this case, Saturday night, Sunday morning wisdom, and we mix it with Monday's answers. We get Saturday and Sunday wisdom, and we mix it with Monday's horoscope. We get Saturday and Sunday wisdom, and we confirm it with the Twitter account. You follow me? We're mixing the wisdom. I will trust you, God, up to this point, or God, I'll leave you out. I'll tend to you later. Thank you very much. You do your thing, and when I need you, I will come and get you. I'm going to turn the GPS off until I'm lost. In Luke chapter 5, Peter is the pro fisherman. He's fishing on his home lake. And Jesus, the itinerant preacher, shows up. And the crowds are pressing on Jesus. And so Jesus says to Peter, who, if you recall from that story, had been fishing all night and had caught what? Nothing. And so here's Peter. He'd caught nothing. And now he's cleaning his nets. And Jesus is there, crowds of people. And Jesus says, hey, Peter, can I borrow your boat? Can I borrow your boat? Peter says, sure, you can borrow the boat. So Jesus gets in the boat. He pushes away from the shore to get himself a little distance from the crowd, and he continues to teach. While he's teaching, Peter is involved cleaning his nets. That's an important uh, aspect of the fisherman's uh, employment. So he's cleaning the nets. Jesus, you do your thing. You stay over there, Jesus. I don't have a problem with that, but I've got, I'm kind of busy right now. I've got nets to tend to. Jesus, wanting to get Peter's attention, says, uh, Peter, excuse me. Can I borrow the nets too? Could we go back out on the lake and do some fishing? (laughs) And Peter's like, I don't want to be rude here, Jesus. 
And I'm sure he said it loud enough for all of the crowd to hear him. But he said, sir, <laughs> we will go out there. At your bidding, we will go back out on the water. In other words, Jesus, this is, crowds, this is not my idea. And they go back out and you know what happened. They caught such a great uh, net of fish that it was dragging the bottom and they had to get help and everything comes in and Peter then changes his tune, falls before Jesus and says, Lord, I'm a sinful man, depart from me. We must be careful, friends, that Jesus is calling and available in all of his resources is infinite wisdom and knowledge and there's a wise path to run but we get busy with our nets and we're not trusting God with all our heart. Continue in the passage now and we're in verse six. Verse six, in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. In all your ways submit to him Make adjustments, this is my version of it, make adjustments to life because God exists. Make adjustments to life because God exists. Because we believe on Monday morning that God made the sun come up and therefore he's got good things in store and adjust our lives to the fact that God exists. You, again, you might say, well, I've got real world issues. I appreciate all that. I got real world issues. Well, here's the good news. Can I tell you that one of the things that we must take away from the book of Proverbs is this. The book of Proverbs is a collection of short sayings based on long observations of all of life. The fascinating thing about the book of Proverbs is it addresses everything in life. The last time I was here in November, I told, I, maybe it was just the last service. I don't think I said it every service. I don't recall. But that, was, that weekend was my 30th year of being in full-time ministry. And I want you to know, in 30 years of ministry, I have heard everything. People come and they tell things to me and they're, they're surprised I'm not surprised but I have heard everything. And here's what I have to share with you tonight that I promise you that whatever your scenario is, there is a principle in this book that addresses it. Just stay within the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs has principles, wise sayings, GPS warnings about parenting how to correct and encourage children, about marriage, things like communication and intimacy, the power of words to encourage and build up and to tear down and destroy. Principles about life and death and perspective, principles about friendships and finances, how to save, how to get out of debt, principles about work, how to be a faithful worker, how to interact with your boss, how to be a good boss. Principles about growing old and living honorably in the sunset years of life. Principles about social issues like justice and care for widows and providing for the hungry. So when the Bible says, in all your ways, adjust life because God exists, it really means in all your ways. What I get out of that, and what I get out of this book, is that God is involved in all of life. Church, one of my concerns is that we've cheated the world because we've made them think that being a Christian is something you do one hour a week. And here's why that's significant. I talk with parents because I have a lot of college students that pass through my ministry. And parents struggle sometimes. Like, 
how do I connect with my child? And there seems to be so many things you know, competing for their allegiance in our day. And I get that. And parents feel, feel sometimes ill-equipped to address all that's going on in our world. And I understand that. But the number one reason why children are walking away from the faith is because of the duplicity that they've seen in the church and in the home. A study was done many years ago about how young people, up to about the age 18, 20 years old, how do they form their assumptions, their worldview, and their faith and here's what they found, the number one influence, the number one influence on young people's lives is the family dining table, meal times, where people converse and talk. Here's what I say to parents. More powerful than all the answers or apologetics about the faith is simply this, an undivided Friends, our 24-7 devotion to God is our greatest apologetic for children. So when I read in this book that, that God has answers and principles for all of life, he is saying, friends, turn the GPS on. Use the wisdom that I'm offering. If you don't, you go screaming past the exit and you end up in Tucson, Arizona. You meant to be in Vancouver. Because here's what happens. When we give God all of our trust, when we decide in all our ways we are going to account for God in our life, we're going to submit to him, here's what happens. Last line of the passage. He will make our paths straight. He will make our paths straight. Here's the image that's being borne out in this verse. It's a beautiful, think if you will, of a caravan, of a carriage and horses and a dignitary in the carriage. And that dignitary would have people out in front of the carriage whose job it was, this is all their job was, was to remove the rocks and the barriers and obstacles to the path so that the carriage can go straight through. In life, when we say, God, I'm trusting you with all my life. God, I will not lean on my own understanding. I submit everything to you. God will begin, not a, God will begin to move obstacles. And my guess is that some of us are losing a lot of sleep and our blood pressure's high because we see the obstacles and we think, how am I ever going to remove that obstacle? Here's the beauty. I really think that we will get to heaven someday and we'll sit down and we'll have a conversation with God and he'll begin to tell us all the times he removed obstacles that we never knew were there. So let me capture the core idea of this passage in a simple proverb. God wants all our heart so he can influence all our ways. God wants all our hearts so he can influence all our ways. Again, back to the message translation provides a good modern version of these verses. It says this, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's GPS voice in everything you do, and everywhere you go, that is wherever you travel, notice what's gonna happen, last line, he's the one who will keep you on track. He's the GPS. He's the one rerouting. You say, I don't have wisdom like that. I got good news for you. God is not stingy with his wisdom. James chapter one, verse five and following says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, 
qualified for that. Qualified for that. If any of you lacks wisdom, James chapter one, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Sounds like Proverbs, doesn't it? You must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. The, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Double-minded. Saturday and Sunday wisdom mixed with Monday answers. Double-minded and God says, I'm not in that. But if you trust the Lord with all your heart and you ask, God, I need wisdom. As we close, I, I'm sure there are people here that you look back over the calendar of your life and you say, you know, the truth is I have driven past my share of exits. I've not chosen the wise route. I've chosen the other wise route. I'm living life. I was living life in the fast lane. I'm so far beyond my original destination. <laughs> and if I look back, I don't even know where I was going. I'm thousands of miles from where I hope to be. And the good news of this morning is that God is in the business of rerouting people. Make a U-turn. Make a U-turn. Trust him entirely. Submit to him. Invite him into every crevice of your life. And then watch him begin to remove obstacles. And all of that begins asking for wisdom. Let's do that now. Will you pray with me? Just in the quietness of the closing minutes here, you may be one of those persons saying, yeah, I have lived life in the fast lane. I have driven past those exits. I need wisdom. I give you just a few seconds, would you just quietly in, the, in your own heart, just ask God for wisdom. Some of you are staring right in the face of an obstacle. And that obstacle is overwhelming your life. It's sleepless nights, it's bad habits, and it feels like the obstacle is gonna win. Would you use a minute now just to say, God, I'm choosing to trust you that you are bigger than the obstacle in front of me. God, thank you. On behalf of all of us in this room, God, I voice a prayer of thanksgiving that we can trust you, that you indeed give wisdom to your people. You remind us of which roads are safe. You tell us when to yield and when to turn and when to stop. Would you give us wisdom, God, that's not our own? Would you give us a portion of heavenly wisdom for all that we need in life, so that we might live every day in honor of you. And that our might journey, our journey might just be the greatest apologetic the world has ever seen as we commit all our ways to you without a divided heart. May we cling to you and lean in on you and give us strength. This we ask, this we pray. In the exalted name above of Jesus, amen and amen.
Now we have prayer warriors who are available to pray with you. Before you exit, you might wanna come forward, take a moment to pray with someone else. I would encourage you to do that. Otherwise, have a blessed night. Go in God's peace.